Are changes on the horizon for CPS Energy and your power bill. Tomorrow marks 100 days since the first snowflakes fell during the February winter storm. For months, I've requested an interview with this woman, the head of CPS Energy. Finally tonight, I sit down with President and CEO Paula Gold Williams to discuss rate hikes, lawsuits, and the tarnished image of the company she runs. All the things that CPS Energy uh, did, I take full responsibility for. I run the company. We try our best. We a winter power outage that CPS out. Energy is continuing to try to dig out of. Not just a billion dollars in bills from energy suppliers, but Paula Gold Williams is also heading a company that's image has taken a beating. We have to keep building their confidence back. We have to keep making more investments. We have to look for new solutions. The slide in public approval for CPS has been steep. In our bare facts poll in April of 2020, their approval rating was at 77%. By March of 2021, it had slipped to 46, due in large part to the power outages, but perhaps also to the way the city owned energy company handled them. Gold Williams was largely unavailable for interviews and the defenders uncovered these internal CPS memos. They show the company tried to rally support for Gold Williams as the outages continued. Memos that perhaps show she was worried as much about PR as the lack of power. And it was just more to get some type of communication going, but it was a draft that never got issued, so we moved on. Was it a mistake? Was it a mistake to draft something? We draft. Well, to talk about the PR in a time when you know, people don't have power. Well, look, I think the important thing is what we know is you have to always communicate to your customers. And the comment was, are you communicating enough? And what the comment needed to be that this team was continuing to fight to make sure that we were creating stabilization. CPS Energy has also come under fire for suing energy suppliers over the high prices during a state emergency. A lawsuit some legal experts call a long shot. Well, number one, the cost of um, lawyers to help us work through these things and consultants is very much a minimal part of a billion dollar bill. We're not talking that, we're trying to save the billion dollars. So you have to, you have, to have people help you fight. A legal fight that could determine whether a rate hike becomes a reality. A bit of a gamble for a leader and a company fighting the cost of winter outages and public perception. The fight is for them. It is absolutely for them. This is a pass through cost, but we think in principle, no San Antonian and no Texan should be required to pay price gouging. CPS Energy says a formal request for an increase in power bill rates is not being made at this time, despite today's presentation to the board. They did, however, leave the opportunity for an increase open for the future. Meanwhile, a committee selected to investigate the winter storm response is preparing to deliver its findings on June 15th. CPS Energy is participating in that review. Well, a major milestone in the vaccine rollout. More than 1 million people in Bear County have had one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. For those who took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it is their only dose. Meanwhile, 47% of those eligible in Bear County are fully vaccinated. The city hoping to increase that number by partnering with Six Flags Fiesta Texas. Again, 20,000 one day tickets to people who get their COVID-19 vaccination starting tomorrow, Tuesday, May 25th, or until uh, supplies tickets run out. 20,000 one day tickets. Those tickets would only be available to those receiving the vaccine at city partnership sites. They include the Alamo Dome, UT Health San Antonio, University Health, University of the Incarnate Word, WellMed, or Bear County Health Collaborative and curative, curative sites. We're also seeing a positive trend when it comes to coronavirus cases. The positive rate dropped to 1.3% and we're seeing 139 COVID-19 cases per day. Right now, 143 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. A mother killed just as she was getting ready to take her children to school. A night beat update in this case. Police say the man detained for questioning only a person of interest. There are still no arrests in this case. The 28 year old mother loading three children into the car ranging in age from two to 10 years old. Police say someone then shot her in front of her children. It happened right outside the MC Belden apartments on Harlow Drive. Police Chief William McManus described the person of interest as being out on bond for violating a protective order against the woman believed to be his estranged wife. 
Anyone with information on this case urged to call the SAPD homicide unit at 210-207. 7635. Police also had their hands full with at least two other shooting cases in the city today. One of them happened as a man was washing his SUV. Police say a man was shot in the chest and carjacked at a car wash on South Florida Street near Southeast Military. The victim was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police said the suspect is believed to be traveling in the victim's stolen gray Chevy Tahoe. Meanwhile, officers have little to go on when it comes to a shooting that claimed a man's life just before noon today. A 24 year old man was shot at the Antioch Village apartment complex on Upland. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. Still no arrests in the case tonight. And Governor Greg Abbott poised to sign the new permitless gun measure. Texas lawmakers gave their own final approval, sending it to the governor for his signature. The bill would allow Texans 21 and older to carry a handgun without training and a background check. Texas already allows rifles to be openly carried without a license. Police have expressed concern over the measure, but supporters say it would allow Texans to better defend themselves. It's a dance hall and a concert venue wrapped in controversy. Cowboys Dance Hall back under the eye of authorities after a weekend concert got out of hand. The night team's Jonathan Cotto spoke with the witness who was there and finds out what's next in the investigation. Cowboys dance hall back in the headlines after another run in with authorities. Despite citations during the pandemic, the venue is still drawing in concert crowds. Crowds grew too large for a Grupo Firme concert over the weekend. I got there at 8 and the line was like around the buildings. This woman shared her experience but did not want to share her identity. Then it was just chaotic and it was very, it was just very packed. Police say the venue exceeded capacity by over 800 people. Cowboys Dance Hall didn't respond for a comment but... On Facebook, they claim another party was in charge of ticket sales. But this concert goer questions who was in charge of the crowds after witnessing two fights inside. I went in and there's like people everywhere rushing to the middle. And then it was just everyone like shoving each other, like trying to get in front. Hired security also witnessed fights after having to turn crowds away. The investigation into this case continues. Back in January, Cowboys Dance Hall hosted a two-day Cody Johnson concert despite a need for social distancing. The added citations then meant the business already had a total of seven citations since the pandemic began. A search online shows the group has sold out venues like the Staples Center in LA. Meanwhile, disenfranchised concert goers are wondering why someone thought the Cowboys dance hall would be a suitable venue. I really think just when it comes to concerts, like especially with like a big group, they could have gotten a bigger arena or something. You could have a different Yeah, like a different venue, like maybe the AT&T Center because it's such a big group. Quite the different scene out here outside of Cowboys Dance Hall and com compared to Saturday night, but fire marshals are expected to provide more details about the incident tomorrow. As for now, people are saying that the posting, the ticketing agency posted for them to get that refund isn't working. We've reached out to Cowboys Dance Hall. We have yet to hear a response. Reporting live, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. Details of a multi-million dollar settlement released in the Cameron Prescott case. Is some of the money going to Prescott's family, the other going to the family of the suspect who was shot and killed by Bear County deputies? Six-year-old Cameron Prescott inside his mobile home when Bear County deputies shot at fraud suspect Amanda Jones, killing her. Some of those bullets also went through the mobile home, killing the little boy. It happened back in 2017. Today, an attorney for one of Prescott's parents confirmed Bear County would pay Prescott's family $4.5 million. Under the agreement, half a million dollars would go to the mother of Amanda Jones, who joined the lawsuit against the county. The settlement will be paid out by the county's insurer. The migrant shelter at Freeman Coliseum's Expo Hall closing today. The last five remaining boys left the facility this morning. Contractors will now be in the building to clean up and break down any equipment before the contract ends on May 30th. The first buses arrive back on March 30th. More than 2,000 unaccompanied teen boys were housed at the facility as they sought asylum. 30% of teen boys were transferred to licensed care facilities, 
but most were reunited with family members. During the two months, um, reuniting 70 percent of a little over 2,000 kids with their host families throughout the country, I would say, is successful. The 30 percent they are still working on because the contract was ending, they transferred to sites and they are continuing to work on their cases to hopefully um, reunite a lot of a lot more with their host families. Now, at one point, Governor Greg Abbott made unfounded allegations of sexual abuse and children not being fed. Again, those allegations were never proven. It's still ahead on the night beat. A look at what weather to expect for your morning commute, plus what rain chances look like for the rest of the week. We're going to check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky in a moment. And what does police reform look like a year after George Floyd's death? We speak with lawmakers and activists who say the fight is far from over. It's coming up next on the night beat. It's been a year since the nation and world watched the killing of George Floyd at the hands of police. And activists say they see a desire for bipartisan change. Several bills are part of the George Floyd Act calling for police reform and are on their final journey before they head to the governor for signature. The night team's Patty Santos tells us activists say the fight continues. We're very optimistic that, that we can have sustainable change for our community, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. From protesting in the streets of San Antonio to inside the state capitol, activist Josie Garcia has made it a mission to advocate for change following the death of George Floyd a year ago tomorrow. It was really eye-opening and, and rewarding to be able to uplift the voices of those families from San Antonio who these laws will directly affect it, the the way policing is done in our community. She was one of several activists who advocated for police reform bills on the state level. Senator Roy West says the George Floyd Act was comprised of several bills that were separated in order to give them a chance to make it to a final vote and law. We wanted to make sure that there was substance, at least in some of the reform. And so we've been able to move some bills, like um, I guess the first bill that has passed and it was authored was a duty to uh, a, window aid. a bill dealing with peace officers intervening when another officer uses excessive force will be heard tomorrow. Overall, West says Floyd's death has brought a sense of accountability when it comes to police and citizen interaction. We need to be embracing it. It needs to be a balanced platform of protecting our police officers. We want to make certain that when they leave home in the morning, they're able to go home in the evening. Garcia says this is a pivotal week for all those voices shouting for change to make the call to lawmakers to pass police reform bills. To say that we're beginning a new age of the civil rights era is an understatement. We're at historic times. And Governor Greg Abbott says he intends to sign a bill that would prevent large cities and counties from cutting funding to law enforcement. This is a major blow to activists who have demanded that funding for law enforcement be reexamined and that that funding be instead put into other community needs. The session ends in a week on Monday. Let's we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. The new numbers are in the first day of early voting and the city's runoff election now complete. 2,731 voters casting a ballot today. That number is expected to rise, though. Early voting continues through the week, ends on Tuesday, June 1st. Election day for the runoff election, Saturday, June 5th. Voters will decide races for city council districts 1, 2, 3, 5, and 9. Head to KSAT.com to find a list of polling locations and hours. You can also read more about the races and the candidates online. I was one of those 2,731 people you vote who today? cast my vote today. Yeah, I was nice. surprised that there was a lot of folks out there. You're usually kind of slow on the first day, it feels like. So but I love seeing yeah. voting lines. Yes. There was a time where folks that volunteered would cheer if somebody came in. Yeah, that early, there you know? were, yeah. Good to see that. All right, I want to talk a lot about uh, how much rain we got over the weekend and, of course, what we're expecting to come in the days ahead. I want to give you a quick rundown of our headlines here. A little damp tomorrow morning, mainly in the form of drizzle and some fog, so reduced visibility and some road spray out there. Then more pop-up showers again as we get into tomorrow midday and afternoon. But here's the key, the aquifer. It's up 18.2 feet 
since April 26th. How about that? Now, just take a look at the rainfall map across South Texas since Saturday. So this is the weekend rainfall and those showers we had today. Obviously, along the Rio Grande, nothing. Zip zilch, nada there. You have to get basically locally around Bear County, I-10 north of town and then eastward. That's where the sweet spots were. But even here in Bear County, we had this swath of heavy rain where a few really heavy downpours followed each other. They trained each other. So Bernie, 2.38. Helotus a little over an inch. You get to the south side of Camp Bullis there, Rogers Ranch area, 2.37. Downtown 3.36. Now, another reason that's significant, that little swath there, is that it's right on the aquifer recharge zone and the contributing zone. So this purple area and the red area, that's where we really like to get the rain to help boost the aquifer. You look at the rainfall, even just since last Tuesday, I put it all on here last Tuesday, right in the sweet spot, Northern Bear County, Southern Kendall and Kamal. And it's good to see that. So the aquifer has responded nicely. By the way, no more stage one and stage two watering. It's been that way for several days now, just back to year round rules. There still are rules to the watering. We just don't have stage one and stage two. A little bit of activity closer to the panhandle. That's a part of Texas. We need the rain. Even West Texas, we had some action today. We really need the rain in West Texas. This little ripple in the upper flow is more over East Texas now, and I think it's going to continue to shift eastward tomorrow. So we'll still have some pop up showers, but as that upper disturbance shifts eastward, I'm thinking those pop up showers later in the day will be primarily shifting eastward as well. And that activity in Mexico is trying to make it eastward. We could have a few showers along the border around in a little after sunrise. Otherwise, here's what we're looking at tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. and even before. Little patches of drizzle here and there, a little sprinkle, fog, reduce visibility. And we get into the midday hours. We're talking 11, noon, 1 o'clock. We'll have some of those pop up showers, most of them eastward along the coastal plain as usual in these situations. So most of them between I 37 and I 10. But even locally, we'll probably have a few pop up. Then the action, as I said, later in the day starts to generally speaking, move eastward a little bit more. So tomorrow's going to look and feel a lot like today, about a 30 to 40% chance by Wednesday down to 20%. And then Thursday and Friday looking dry, I think we'll be too capped. Our atmosphere will be too capped and sealed off to really get anything going. Today, we had just under an inch at the airport. How's that? 71 in the morning, 84 for the afternoon high. The average is 89. We'll be there again later this week. 76 now, very humid. Dew points low 70s. We're feeling the mugginess. Right now, air temperatures mostly in the 70s. The dew point and air temperature are going to meet tomorrow, and I think we'll have that fog and drizzle to start. And then some sunshine mixed with the clouds and the showers, that tropical feel again tomorrow afternoon. Pretty much the same on Wednesday, just not as much coverage and then things quiet down for the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Even Memorial Day Monday right now, it's kind of odd to have a Memorial Day. We're going to have storms in the forecast, yeah. but <laughs> partly cloudy near 90. Wow. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. All right. It is NBA playoff time. It is also award season for yep. the NBA. And this is a huge honor for a young man who used to play his high school basketball right here in the San Antonio area. We're talking about Jordan Clarkson, who's a winner of the NBA Six Man of the Year Award tonight. Got that for you coming up. Plus, Deshaun Watson says he will not report for OTAs. Coming up. Jordan Clarkson, he became the first member of the Utah Jazz to ever win the NBA Sixth Man of the Year award. That's after he averaged a career-high 18.4 points per game that included another career-high 208 made three-pointers. While he did start one game, his average as a reserve at 18.3 points per game was the highest in the NBA. Jordan graduated from Wagner High School in 2010, and here's how the voting looked. He kind of ran away with it because he had 60. Five first place votes compared to 34 for his own teammate, Joe Ingles, who came in second for the Utah Jazz, and Derrick Rose with the Knicks at one first place vote. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson says he is skipping the all voluntary team activities and still wants to be treated, even though he's facing as many as 22 civil lawsuits for sexual assault and misconduct. That's according to the NFL Network that says it still remains to be seen when Watson will return to the field as the NFL continues its own investigation that could lead to a suspension. It is for that reason teams are reluctant to speak with the Texans about the trade, not knowing if they will be around to even start this season. 
Julio Jones is not being traded to the Dallas Cowboys. The Falcons wide receiver made that very clear today. Speculation went rampant when a fan posted a picture of himself with Jones wearing a Dallas Cowboys sweatshirt after Jones had demanded a trade during the offseason. He doubled down on that demand when he told Fox Sports 1 Shannon Sharp today that he's out of here. And when pressed on whether or not he would want to play for the Dallas Cowboys, his answer was, I'm out of there. NFL.com reported that Jones had asked for a trade a few months ago and that the Falcons were listening to offers and trying to accommodate him. But the 32-year-old has a contract that guarantees him over $15 million next season, and they would have to find a team that has this, at this point, that has the cap space available since the contract runs through 2023. There are 11 teams with cap space available, including Jacksonville and New England. Meantime, Dallas Cowboys rookie cornerback Deshaun Wright is clearing the air about his draft night comments when he was picked in the third round by the Dallas Cowboys. At the time, he called himself a more athletic and agile Richard Sherman, which prompted a quick reaction by Sherman on social media. During the Cowboys rookie minicamp, Wright says he decided to send Sherman a direct message on Instagram to clear the air and explain himself. I actually reached out to him um, just because after I said it, I kind of seen what people kind of perceived it as. So um, I wanted to reach out to him personally and kind of clear it up and just kind of tell him that I actually modeled myself after him and wanted to kind of I emulate my game uh, after him. Of all the free agents the Spurs have this offseason, the one most fans believe will return next season is Patty Mills, the last holdover from the 2014 championship game and, of course, a player that has invested in this community. That's according to our poll last night on Instant Replay. DeMar DeRozan, Rudy Gay are the other two big game free agents here with DeRozan more than likely demanding the max deal as an unrestricted free agent. The Spurs are in the NBA draft lottery, even though their chances of landing the top pick are less than 2%. But they still have many other young players to build on for next season, including Lonnie Walker IV, Keldon Johnson, Devin Vassell, and Drew Eubanks. Lonnie's guy I came in with uh, bonded a lot with Keldon over these past two years. And, you know, we all love to work. We all love to get better. We all love each other. Um, I'm just I'm proud of them for the steps, jumps that they've taken this year. And I know they're going to work their ass off this offseason. All right. Not everyone happy with the gallery that swarmed lefty the PGA championship next. It was a moment to remember in sports history. Phil Mickelson swarmed by the gallery of the PGA Championship as he approached the final hole with the lead. Never before has anyone at the age of 50 has ever won a major until now. And while Phil called the moment slightly unnerving but exceptionally awesome, not everyone felt the same. Brooks Kepka, who came in second at 4-under, claimed members of the crowd bumped into his knee that had been surgically repaired in March. It would have been cool if I didn't have a knee injury and got dinged a few times in the knee in that crowd because um, no one really gave you personally. Um, but if I was fine, yeah, it would have been cool. Um, you know, it's cool for Phil, but um, getting dinged a few times isn't exactly my idea of fun. All right, with the Tokyo Olympics now two months away, Olympic champion Laura Wilkinson is preparing to make her comeback. Houston native and three-time Olympian struck gold in the 10-meter platform competition in the Sydney Olympics back in 2000. And she's on the comeback trail after coming out of retirement and recovering from neck surgery in 2018. Wilkinson competed at a diving meet right here in San Antonio on Sunday afternoon at Northside Swim Center. She was actually in San Antonio competing back on March the 10th of last year, the day before the COVID-19 pandemic shut down everything. How much has changed for her since then? It's been quite a year. Uh, actually, just got kind of on the upper levels back here again this March because we haven't been able to get into any platforms until this past March here in San Antonio. So, yeah, it's been an interesting full circle. Love this pool, love the people here. And it's just always been a warm, inviting environment. And it's a great meet today with perfect tune-up for trials in a couple of weeks. Olympic trials, by the way, are scheduled to begin on June the 6th at the Indiana University Natatorium. It's great to see San Antonio trapping shuts that caliber of an athlete. Well, that facility is, is that good. It is that good. You're right. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. All right, let's talk a little bit more about precipitation at the airport, uh, especially month to date, 4.43 inches. It's an inch above average since January 1st. We're 1.6 inches above average. Good news. Good news. Absolutely. GMSA at 430 in the morning. Good night.